morning, everyone. So uh, my name is Sandra Uiringimana, and this is my sister Adele Kiwasumba. It's very rare that um, we're speaking together. Usually I do these kinds of talks by myself and usually about our experiences, but today I think you're all very, very fortunate to have Adele here. She is an incredible advocate and honestly, I wouldn't be where I am if I didn't grow up in the family that I grew up in. And Adele and my older sisters and my mother and my father are a huge part of why I am an activist. So tonight we thought we would just talk to you a little bit about our experiences and about what we're doing today. So we grew up in the Republic Democratic of Congo, a huge country in the middle of Africa, very rich in natural resources, but very poor due to uh, very poor governance and corruption and greed. So the people of Congo live on unlivable wages. The average uh, wage for a woman in Congo is less than 75 cents a day, which is just despicable for people that literally live on top of gold mines. Our childhood was always very disrupted due to the conflicts surrounding the area. However, where we come from, the conflict wasn't about the minerals. It was usually about the uh, discrimination against the minority group, the Banyamulenge people, which we both belong to. The Banyamulenge people settled in Congo over 350 years ago. Back then, there were no borders the way we know them today in Africa, and people migrated freely. And we simply found ourselves on the wrong side of the border. And ever since then, though we had been discriminated against for years, things didn't really get as bad as they did until after the Rwandan genocide. After the Rwandan genocide, a lot of the perpetrators fled to neighboring countries, one of them being Congo. And then that led the Rwandan people to be uh, invading different parts of Congo, trying to capture those predators. However, a lot of Congolese lives were lost during that process, and it created a, an even more animosity towards my people, the Banyamlenge people. And since then, we've basically been on the run. Uh, my mother tells me that she grew up fleeing, and now she's fleeing with her children. So it's generational in Congo. We had a really great childhood, though, despite everything. And I think Adele lived most of us. So I'll let her tell you a little bit about um, her experiences in Congo. What she said. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'll talk about the childhood, because she knows that we had the best childhood in Congo, despite all of that. Uh, we lived in a little town called Uvira. It's in South Kivu of um, Democratic Republic of Congo. We live near Lake Tanganyika. Um, it's known to have the most fishes, so we eat a lot of seafood. Um, and we also swim uh, before school, so it was really fun. In the middle of the town, there's a river called Kalmabenge. That's where we used to go uh, wash dishes and also play right after, before you could return dishes to your mother. Um, we had a lot of just natural uh, sunlight and um, we were surrounded by beautiful mountain if you wanted to swim to uh, go for a hike um, we ate a lot of mangoes uh, there was so much food around I just didn't know any like hunger all these things that they show you on TV we didn't know that um, it was we, we had a beautiful childhood it was just we played it was normal we never imagined coming to America because we felt like we had everything uh, despite all the, you know, the poverty around. Um, we had families in, um, in a remote areas. My grandparents uh, live in their farmers and they also um, have a lot of cows. So in the summer break, our parents will send us to the mountains where our grandparents live and will help our, my grandmother fetch water. Um, we would help her um, watch over her um, Goats. Goats. <laughs> um, and uh, it was it was really fun. And then, but before I could go back to school, my grandpa, my grandma would give me money, packet money. So it was 
it was fun and um, so I, I felt like I helped my mom by going to help her, and her mother and she helped me. Um, so I, we had really tight family roots, um, um, so on both sides, so it was, it was just fun and um, even with the, with the conflict, whenever it erupted, we would flee to the neighboring country, Burundi, it was an hour away drive and we would wait for a few months until things stabilize and we'll be, ba uh, and we'll be back in, in school again. Um, think of it as a snow day. And just a little longer, and then you come back and you pick up where you left off. Yeah, it, it truly was the most magical place to grow up. Um, Adele often likes to remind me that she got to enjoy more of it than me, so she's more qualified to talk about it. Um, we, as she said, the disruption was constant, but we really felt like this is how people lived. We didn't know any different. We really thought we had a very normal life, despite you know, having every single world relief organization in the area. Um, like UNICEF was always there, UNHCR was always there, but it really didn't mean anything to us. We, um, we just thought our life was normal. In 2004, we left the country for what would be our last time, even though we didn't know it at the time. We thought just another, another one of Congo's phases of conflict. Before we could leave though, um, my family was robbed of everything we had. And actually Adele and my brother Chris could not come with us because they had already left for school. So these things were always urgent. It was never like we had a week to plan the escape. It was always like, oh, we have to go right now. So that day, I remember it vividly. I, I was just getting ready to go to school. Adele and my brother Chris were already gone. And my father just comes in and says, we have to go. Um, I can't imagine what it felt for, for Adele to have to flee separately from her family. But when we left uh, with my dad and mom, everything we had was stolen. And we found ourselves in the refugee camp in Burundi. Uh, Adele, you can talk more about your experience and what it's like to be a displaced um, teenager by yourself. Um, so when I returned, so we had um, morning sessions and afternoon session. That's why she's saying that I was already gone. Um, so my brother and I went to the same school. Uh, so when we, when we were at school, the principal told us that all the Banyamulenge kids, you need to leave. And he was a friend with my dad. He, he wanted to protect us. So he said, you have to leave because all of you have to leave town. Otherwise, there's like um, genocidal thoughts or like speeches going on to kill you all. Um, so he basically like um, had us escape. I remember running uh, through like the quartier, but, uh, like through the neighborhood, and I would want to like make my nose look bigger so I don't look tutti. If you guys know about the random tutti, um, the, the tutti that were killed because of the way they look. So the Banyamulenge, the only difference is we look like tutis and not like the other Congolese. Um, and we, our features are tutis. And I remember running through the neighborhood and um, I would try to like make my nose look big so that I, they, they don't kill me before I reach home. And um, I ran, came to find out the bus had already left that carried my, my whole family. I was a teenager, I think I was 12 or 13 and my brother was like 14. Um, we, we found uh, one a family member that was a, a military in a, the national military, and he he called my dad and we asked him what should we do? Should we hop in another bus with neighbors so we can uh, meet you in Gatumba because I mean in at the border because we're used to it. He told us that they were robbed. Uh, there are like rebel groups in on the road all throughout. They were almost. Um, they were held captive, they were tortured, and they took everything from them. He said it wouldn't be safe. They are taking women to rip them in the, in the bushes. Do not come. Just go go to the mountain, like where, to the villages where your grandparents live. So, of course, there were a bunch of kids just our age 
our friends that we grew up with, um, we, start, we, we started hiking. It takes three days by foot to get to where my grandparents live. And I went with my brother, we had one bag. Usually, um, on a normal summer, summer time, we would uh, pay someone to carry your luggage. We were kids, but at that point, we didn't, really didn't have anyone because it was a war. So my brother and I, my brother was a little jerk, so he had me carry it myself. And I, I dropped it in the river, so guess what? It got heavy, and I couldn't, I couldn't lift it. But at the same time, this is all I have, so I can't really um, leave it. So I kept, I kept crying and carrying it. And the other guys that were together, they're like, Chris, you're such a jerk. Why don't you help your sister? So it was just um, an experience. I remind, I remind him all the time. Um, <laughs> Um, so we, we have, it was a lot of kids of my age that left with no parents. Um, you know, the disp being displaced is harder because when they cross the border, there's the UNHCR right there helping them to uh, get to the refugee camp and providing, uh, you know, first aid or food aid and things like that. But when you're, when you're displaced, you're kind of on your own. No one follows you. No one. Um, helps helps you. You just you know there. If you don't get killed and you get to a safe place, you don't really have any food. You don't really have any medical attention if you need it. Um, so we would all those three days we would sleep where we got tired and we picked up the next morning. Um, and it was just all I remember. It was a lot of kids, no parents, and. Uh, thankfully, we got to where my grandpa lived, and we were okay because where they lived, there was no conflict. But we kept following on how my parents and and my sisters and brothers how they were doing. That was in uh, June when we the conflict erupted, and in August. Um, I, what's up? Okay. Yeah, I'll let Sandra pick up where she left off, uh, but I'll talk about how I heard about the massacre. So obviously it was really terrifying. I didn't really know what was going on because I was so young. All I knew was Adele and Chris were not there. And we found ourselves in a refugee camp that wasn't even a refugee camp when we arrived. It was just a field. And the first night, just all 500 families were just sleeping outside. Um, and I remember they gave a, they distributed these itchy blankets, like wool blankets, because everybody was sleeping outside. And the next several days, the UNHCR people came in and started building the and started building the camp while we were we were right there. And for those days, we did not have any water because they had to bring in the the plastic tank that that held the water for us. And so they were just very desperate um, situations. You can, as you can imagine, no running water, no toilets, no anything like that. Um, just 500 people in a field. But we got used to refugee camp life, even though it was very hopeless. There was nothing to do. There were no schools. Um, I remember that time was the time where we usually have our national exams for sixth grade and 12th grade. And I was in the sixth grade. And I was devastated because I knew that if I didn't take that exam, I wouldn't be able to go into the next grade. And my older sister, Princess, who was in 12th grade, if she didn't take it, the exam, she wouldn't be, get, be able to get her high school diploma. Um, we didn't get to stay in the refugee camp for that long. But statistically, when you step foot in a refugee camp, you're likely to spend at least 20 years there. Uh, according to UNHCR. And that's a, the global average. In some places like Somalia, it's um, 43 years, I believe. So we were somewhat fortunate to not be part of the statistic, but um, on August 13th, out of nowhere, the camp was attacked. It was something that's unheard of because usually when you're in a refugee camp, even though the conditions may be terrible, you have this idea that you are safe because you're, you're under UN protection. So we thought we were safe. And even when the attack began, 
people didn't believe it. I just remember I was already sleeping and my mom comes in screaming and saying that we were under attack and that my aunt had been shot and I, you know, people were laughing at her and saying, no, we're not under attack. It's probably people trying to steal cattle from the farms nearby. So, but it quickly, within a matter of minutes, we realized that we were indeed in, under attack. As I gained consciousness, I, I realized that my aunt was actually shot and her arms were dangling. And everything happened so fast. And in a matter of three hours, 166 people were killed. My sister, Deborah, our youngest sister, was murdered that night. Um, our cousin, was also murdered that night. And many of our childhood friends, many of our neighbors that we grew up playing with, um, we knew people that lost entire families. So the next day, people were literally just running around trying to see if who, which member of their family survived. Um, because the way the tents were set up, men and women had to stay in different, different sides of the camp due to the lack of privacy. So I had no idea while it was going on who survived and who didn't. I had no idea if my brother Heritage or Alex or my dad were alive. Um, at one point, I had no idea if my mother had even survived. All I knew was that I saw her and my sister get gunned down. So I, for the entire night, I was under the assumption that they were both killed. And all I could think of was, what if, what if my dad is dead too? Then what? Then what's going to happen to me? Um, How did you su survive? Um, I, I survived by, um, well, I was under the mattress that my mom like, put me under while the, the gunfire was happening. Uh, there was no way to escape because we literally saw people who tried to escape get gunned down one by one, my cousin included. Um, and I was actually about to run right after her. And, my, and we saw that and then my mom pulled me back and she put us back into the place we usually slept and took the mattress, the little thin mattress that we slept on and covered us with it. Which really looking back made no sense because it bullets, mattress, I don't, you know, I, I don't know how she thought this was going to protect us, but I guess, you know, being a parent, you just want to do whatever you can to protect your children. Um, but at one point, there were two, two men that we thought were there to rescue us because they literally were shouting, is anybody still alive? Because at this point, they had killed everyone they could find or people had managed to escape. And my mom and I, my two cousins, and my sister and my aunt were the only people left in that tent. Um, so the, when the two men came and said they were there to rescue us, we thought maybe the Burundian forces had, fi had finally heard all of this commotion and, and came to rescue people. But um, we went up to the front of the tent and they were standing there. One guy was holding a, a gun, like a huge gun, a machine gun, and the other was holding a roll of bullets. I had never seen anything like that outside of like Jean-Claude Van Damme movies or Rambo movies. I had never seen anything like that. Um, I was like 15, minute, 15 feet behind my mom because for some reason I was just like, don't go up there. I didn't trust them, but maybe it could have been because I had just seen so many people get gunned down and I didn't want to approach a man with a gun. But when we got to the front, um, the guy said, shoot them. And he just opened fire. And I just remember seeing sparks flying and I ran back to where my mom had hit us and I went back under that mattress. And after that, I was certain that I had just seen my mom and sister and everyone uh, be killed. So when I woke up, um, I think I blacked out for a little bit because I, I woke up with the tent had been set on fire and um, the droppings were falling on me. And so I, I could suddenly, I suddenly see everything around me. So I it ran through the flames and as soon as I stepped out of the tent, I could literally see the rebels taking people's suitcases, like my mom's suitcase, our neighbor's suitcase. Um, 
And as I'm trying to figure out my way around, I'm held by gunpoint. And I didn't really know what to do because I was a kid. So in my mind, I thought we have done something to deserve this. And I did what my parents had always taught me, which is if you've done something wrong, apologize. So I looked at this man and I said, forgive me. And I'll never know why he didn't kill me, but he kicked me to the side and ran after another guy that was trying to escape. And I found my way through the farms and, you know, falling into dump, dumpsters. And I made it out and somebody told me that my mom had survived, which I did not believe. Um, and the next, like in the early morning hours, I reconnected with my mother who told me about Deborah's death. Um, she was shot in the back of her head. Um, and the only reason my mom survived was because all of the bodies around her fell on top of her, um, including Deborah's. That next day though, we were all just going around trying to see who survived. Um, eventually we found my father and my brother Heritage who had been shot. Um, my mom was also shot, but she refused to leave me and my brother Alex. Um, but over the next few days, they took them to the hospitals and we stayed with family friends. Um, I'll let you talk about how you heard about that. I was at my, um, my aunt's house and um, we heard the news on BBC. Um, they said that the, the Katumba bat camp was attacked and they said the number of people. So I expected that some of my family members have been murdered as well. And um, it was like a breaking news so they didn't really have names of people who died and they promised to um, read out a list the next day. Um, so I was young. Um, I, the, next, the next morning we went to where, uh, you know, they used to use these like radios with anten antennas. So um, you have to go to a specific place to really get a good frequency. Um, so I made sure I went for, um, to make sure like I, I hear the list of people who died. Um, but you know, it was so, so um, early that they didn't really have a whole list of people. Um, so I went that day and we really couldn't get, we, could really, we really couldn't get a good, a good frequency to listen to the BBC. Um, but there was a guy that came from Ovira who knew who died. He, um, he came to see me, I knew him because we were neighbors in Ovira and he, he told me about my cousin, and somehow he hid me. He hid that my sister had died. I don't know if he thought that I, um, I probably wouldn't handle it, um, but he knew it, but he didn't tell me. But then he, he, he left a note after he left that, oh yeah, your sister also died. Um, but then the next morning, we got a readout of the whole list of people who died, and. Um, I remember listening to like an entire family wiped out. Um, all my childhood friends, you know, you know, they, the whole family is completely wiped out. And I'm just like, and this is how I processed it to be able to deal with it. It was that, okay, I only lost one and my cousin. And, and I'm looking at like Ziraj's family, they lost everybody. So I should be thankful. That's how I processed it. Um, but um, I mean, looking back, it still haunts us, you know, because 
Like Deborah was the youngest, so she was the most innocent of all of us. She didn't deserve to die that way, even though she was the only one in my family. Um, but I still use the same thought process that we're lucky that, you know, because my whole family was in, in that camp. They could have been very well killed, all of them, and I would have stayed with my brother, Chris. Um, but I, 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 I said we were, thank, we were thankful that for, um, you know, just one person dying. I don't know if that's the right way to process it, but that's how I, I deal with it. A um, few months after the massacre, we left to join the family. Um, we, we again went from the, the villages to Abu Bira, my, my brother and I, and the tension between um, our tribe and the other tribes that we live with was still really high. Um, they imprisoned my brother. I think they just wanted money. Um, he, was, he was in jail for a few days, um, and I remember calling my dad and I said, you see Chris, he's such a jerk. I don't know what he told the police. He, he got arrested, I, I, but coming to find out it was the police that wanted money. Uh, it was this young, like a tall man. He was very like intimidating. Um, he told me to come to see him at his house. I went with my dad's friend and he said that friend, that my dad's friend should not come in. I was so afraid, I said, what if this guy rapes me? But I need to get my brother out. Um, I, I went in with $5 that we had for, you know, tickets, ticket money. And I said, I, I need my brother to uh, be released because we are going to Burundi. He goes, well, your brother told me you have more money that your grandpa sold cows for you guys. So you have money, you need to give me more so I can release him. I said, I really don't, because he had the money in the packet. When he got arrested, they took everything away. I'm I only able to buy you, you know, $5 units for your, your phone. He said, okay. He released my brother. The next morning, we went to the bus, and we got poisoned. How we know this? We got on the bus. Um, this is like a, a road that we're used to, going from Bouvier to Burundi. It's only one hour. When we got to the border, I started feeling sick. And my brother felt the same way, but he didn't tell me. When we reached Burundi, we both had the same symptoms. We were all just imagine having food poison, but a much <laughs> stronger poison. Um, and that they just saw the way we looked and they poisoned our food. Um, we, we were taken to the doctor who tasted and told us it was food poison. And uh, we had the symptoms for quite a while, you know, like we had stomach pain, very severe. Uh, for like a good month and uh, thankfully we survived. Um, then we joined Sandra mm -hmm. in, in Rwanda, but she has to say how she got <laughs> in Rwanda. I don't think we have enough time, <laughs> but if you guys want to read the whole journey, um, you can read the book. But we're going to skip forward to coming to America just because as here we can, we can sit here and tell you stories all day, literally, but you we don't have enough time. Um, so we, as she said, we ended up in Rwanda again because we were too traumatized to stay in Burundi. And shortly after that, the UN began the process for resettling the survivors of the Gatumba massacre. And my dad got us back to Burundi. We were illegal immigrants. We didn't have any sort of paperwork at all. So we had to go, you remember the shady way that my dad, the dad took us to get to Burundi? It was, we, we went into like this small boat where this fisherman just like helped us cross in this rural area and we ended up, I don't even know where, um, but like we crossed and ended up in Burundi. Um, the process took two years and a lot of, so if you're 18 in, in that process, you get your own case. So Adele, and myself, and, and Alex were the, only, uh, were the only kids that were underage, so we were under our parents' case. And my brother Heritage was the first one to be resettled, and then us, we were resettled in April of 2007. 
and then shortly after, Chris joined us as well. This process is, it, it takes a long time. Even though ours took two years, there were people still being resettled in 2015 from that same process. So I like to point that out because I think that there are a lot of misinformation about refugees, migrants, and like the vetting process of refugees. You are always worried about who you're letting in. We were forced to relive the worst day of our lives over and over and over and over and over again for two years in order to, to be admitted to come to the US. Um, when we got here, I think we expected the America we've always heard of and, and seen through music videos and you know, we thought we we're gonna come here and just have all these resources, have money and cars and just be rich and be able to help everybody back home. Um, <laughs> it was not like that at all. We ended up, we, we were resettled in like the inner city of Rochester, not very good neighborhood. Um, we were enrolled in like failing schools the school I started at is now shut down because it was that bad. Um, Adele was 17, going on 18. You, were, you turned 18. Um, and then, I mean, you go ahead and tell them. <laughs> well, I wasn't too, um, I was too old for high school and I was, I was so I, I had not finished high school, coming from, um, Burundi and I was too old for high school so they found me a job as a housekeeper in a hotel and I did it for a month and I said to myself I'm like wow my life would have been so much better in Congo because I had so much aspiration to become a doctor in Congo and now I'm here to become a housekeeper this is bad I went back to my social worker and I said um, I really want to go back to school. He said, yes, you can. You, you do D GED, and you go to, in the same class as your, my mom and dad. I mean, no disrespect to my mom. She didn't go to school back in Congo, and she had no plan to finish college, so why should I be in the same class with my mom? Um, the thing is, our parents were just helpless. If we was in Congo, my dad would move mountains for us to have all the resources and, and um, go to good schools because we did go to good schools in Congo. Um, but over here, they didn't speak the language, they didn't have the resources, they don't know the system, so they couldn't help me. And um, I relied on my social worker uh, to really be my advocate, but he said, mm -mm, you're about the age. So I told one of uh, an immigrant family that came here from Congo, they've been here for a little bit, uh, for a, lo a little while and he knew the system. I told him to take me to a school district where they do registration. He drove me and he dropped me and told me that's the office. I don't know why he <laughs> dropped me because I didn't really speak the language. How was, that, how was I gonna like advocate for myself? But I don't know, he, uh, I entered the building and I said, I'm a refugee. So they already know, okay, we know who to call. We're gonna call Catholic Family Center. And they're the ones that do the resettlement for a refugee. They know who she is. Usually they don't deal with refugee to refugee. It's usually the, uh, the social worker that would do it. So um, I, I think I, I remember the word I knew. I knew school. I, I kept saying school, school. And they called my social worker and the same, he gave them the same message that she's too old for high school. I banged, the, I banged the tables and I said, no, 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 I'm not leaving school, school, school. <laughs> she, uh, she said, okay, come with me. She picked up her car keys and she took me in her car and she drove me to the family learning center where my parents go to school and my older siblings. And I got there, she took us to an office with uh, the director of the learning center and she said, do you know this girl? She said, yeah, 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 I know her. She's uh, from the Nyakuri family. And so I was still in tears. You know, I was very dramatic. I was like, I'm not leaving this office. <laughs> um, so they huddled together, and I'm just like this, like, mm -hmm, fix it. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, they said, OK, we have a plan. You get to go to a, a summer school where you're going to take English classes. And if you do well, 
you're gonna go to a high school one year. And if you don't do well in, high, in uh, summer school, then it's over, you do GED. I said, okay. Um, but then they had said, oh, like, you have a job and everything. I said, well, I like my job, but I have to go to school. I'm too young to be doing this my whole life. I have a very long life ahead of me. And um, yeah, so then I went to um, summer school. That went well, as expected. <laughs> and then I went one more year to high school. I graduated, then I was able to go apply for community college. Honestly, my English was still very poor. I didn't mind it, but I, I went and I took classes from, you know, like English 101, like ESL 101, up until when I was able to take English, um, English I guess, college level English. And from there on, I transferred to a nursing uh, four-year school. I finished my nursing uh, degree, and then just this December, I became a nurse practitioner. It's very inspiring. I told you guys you were lucky to have her. Um, but yeah, that's just one of the many, many experiences that we had coming here. And Adele won't tell you this, but she also joined the track team her oh, senior okay. year. <laughs> and her first ever track meet, I'm going to tell her first ever track meet, she didn't know that they shot the, the gun up for people to run. So as she's getting ready to run, they shoot the gun and she just starts running the other way. <laughs> <laughs> because she thought they were under attack. <laughs> um, that's just like how ill-prepared we were to live in America. Like no one really explained anything to us. We were just figuring things out as we went. Um, for me, I was in middle school, so it, it was tough because, you know, as a kid, you just want to make friends and you want to feel like you fit in at school. Um, so it was tough not not fitting in and not having any friends and not having anyone to talk to except my family and siblings. But eventually we adapted and I actually ended up getting a, schol a full scholarship to go to the, one of the best private schools in the area. Um, I, I did really well, I graduated. I mean, we all, like, we fought really, really hard to actually have our education because we didn't have any help along the way. We usually, we always had help from our parents because they're very passionate about educating us. But coming here, they didn't really know how to help us. So you kind of had to figure out your own way around. Um, anyway, like today, Adele and I, so even back then in high school, as we're having all these experiences, we're also traveling around the country, singing, dancing, telling stories and raising money to help other survivors that were left, um, because as I said, there are some that were still being resettled until 2015, and they, they didn't have anything. So we would pay tuition for some of them. Um, we continued activism, because we felt like this is just what we needed to do. This, we, did, we felt like it was just our duty, like we made it out, so we gotta help other people as well. Um, this continued and I, eventually I started doing photographs because I, I wanted to educate my community in Rochester about who we were, what refugees are, what Gatumba, what Gatumba survivors are because people had this like idea of who we were and you know assumed maybe we weren't educated, maybe we hate where we come from, maybe you know you're just so lucky to be here. And I just wanted to show people that no, I actually loved where I come, love what I come from. This me being here is a survival. It's, it's purely survival. It's not because I, I aspired to live in America or to be an American. I was perfectly fine and happy being um, in Congo with my family and if I had it my way, I would still be there with my entire family, with Deborah, like not having to go through any of the things we went through. Um, in my senior, in my junior year of high school, uh, my photo exhibit was shown, <clears throat> was shown at the Women in the World Summit, and then I was invited to speak about it, about women in war. Little did I know that this was one of the biggest um, conferences, women's conferences, in the world. And I ended up being on a panel with Madeleine Albright and Angelina Jolie. 
talking about um, women in war. And I'm 17 years old, because like, I'm still very, very insecure about my English. And I actually almost didn't do it when I saw the stage. And they told me that over 3,000 people were going to be seated in there. I said, there's no way I'm doing this. But I was with my sister, Frances, and you know, she really encouraged me. She said, don't worry, you got this. You, you just go and be yourself and, and, and tell them the story. So I did, and after that, things just, I just found myself in this role of advocating. When I set out to start being an advocate, I just wanted justice for Deborah. It was a very selfish thing. Um, I didn't, I wasn't really going in there to be a voice for anybody. No one asked me to do it. I just was very angry. I was an angry teenager who wanted justice um, for her sister, and then, so, but we continue to do a lot of um, work back home. And then in college, I, I, I wrote this book, and here I am now. But during that, we also founded the Jimberry Fund, um, an organization that works back home to help women start small businesses. Most of these women are already business owners, but they don't have the resources to expand and to make a living out of that. So we give them some training and help them develop their businesses. Uh, we would love to um, show you a video of what's going on back home because the reason we're still doing this and still, still spreading awareness is because this has not stopped. What we, our experiences that we just told you in Congo, people are going through it right now. Like our people are being massacred as we speak. Um, and so we'd love to show you a quick one minute video about it and, and then we'll get back to talking about that. Yeah, so uh, as you can see, um, these women are actually protesting because women and girls are the most vulnerable when it comes to conflict. Um, the men go fighting and men, women and girls are left vulnerable. And many of them experience a lot of sexual violence, a lot of physical violence. And ever since basically May of last year, this violence has been ongoing. Um, a lot of people have been killed. A lot of women have been sexually assaulted. Um, and Adele is actually the president of our community here in the US. And she's been very hot, like involved in everyday activities back home, which I literally cannot do because it's just like, it, it's disheartening to see the same things that we've spent years advocating for happening. Um, uh, the, way, the reason why we do what we do is because we really believe in Congo and we believe that things will change eventually. It takes time, but it will change. Um, the women are protesting. This happened last week because even though there is conflict and they're surrounded by rebels in this center called Minembwe, 
um, and they're fighting. Fighting's happening uh, almost every day. Um, they were holding on one hope. There was this police chief, we mentioned his name because we didn't want to jeopardize his safety when we don't have any protection measures for him. He's been with them for three years. Um, when the conflict erupted, he really stood up for the community and for civilian. Uh, the, the military, the national military that's there to fight the rebels, they're not doing as, um, they're not really acting as they should. We have videos of them sniffing on drugs. They're very impaired. Um, they terrorize um, they terrorize the civilians. They they hold women captive in their military camps and they rape them. Um, they um, they basically just chaos and they're trying to steal things from civilians. And what the chief did was that he started patrolling alongside with the, uh, the national uh, military. And he would literally hold them accountable. He would um, arrest them, and they didn't like that. Um, they, um, th there was a tension between the, the police, the police, uh, the police department and the military because they felt the military could do whatever they want, and this police chief was not patrolling and holding them accountable and, and putting them in jail, and also going out his way to find the women who were held captive in the military camp and rescuing them. And because of that, they, they accused him of some things and they wanted to, they, remo they rem removed him from his post. And the, the march is the same day that they, uh, they came to remove him and the women were not having it. Um, so he was basically his, uh, their last line of defense and they were removing him from protecting them. And we started our petition because 90% of the Congolese um, pol police forces funded by the UN, the United Nations. We started a petition to help um, amplify the voices of these women to the UN to um, keep the police chief in his post so he can protect these women. Um, so I would like you guys to also sign the petition to stand in solidarity with these women who are marching for their rights. Um, yeah, that's it right there. Hopefully they, they'll listen. Um, a uh, majority of the women were, some of the women that we were helping, they were displaced, internally dis displaced uh, from many different parts of the, uh, the area. And there are um, almost 70, 70, 77, sorry, 65% of the population is displaced and they're all packed in this area called Minembo. And uh, because of our, our people are very like family oriented, they never allow all these displaced families to live out in the open. Um, and because of that, some, somehow the international community doesn't see the problem. What ends up happening, they're all leaving. Um, one family is um, hosting three to five families. So the area is very crowded and therefore there is a lot of infectious disease that are spreading. Um, the hospital, there's one hospital uh, some women are not able, they're not even able to get into the maternity to give birth, so they give birth in the house and they get sick and the babies die. Um, and um, this area is very isolated. There are no, um, there's no road to get to it. There's only, um, you can go by plane and the planes are very expensive. The UN, the UN does not carry humanitarian aid to the area. So the diaspora, part of my job has been to really get the funds from the Banyamulenge people uh, who come from this area to donate money. We thought, okay, we can do this because it might take a few months, but this has been going on since February, so it's almost uh, a year, and we're just, we can't handle it. The government of Congo doesn't really provide any humanitarian aid. Uh, the international community has removed their people because it's a conflict zone and it's not safe for them. So it's really us who are from this area. We still have, I still have my grandparents there. So I really, Sandra and I have no choice. And many of the Banyamulenge people who come from this area, we have no choice, we cannot leave them. Because if they don't, they don't die by the bullets, they will die from starvation. So uh, the Jimbere, our Jimbere fund has, um, 
redirected their interventions to uh, humanitarian aid, mainly medical supplies, because all these people are packed in one area and they don't really have uh, medical attention and we have a lot of people being shot and there's no way to evacuate them unless it's absolutely necessary, then the, the Croix Rouge, the Red Cross would evacuate. Those are almost dying to uh, the nearest town in Bukavu. But other than that, they, they, they have to be treated in Minembe and there are, no, um, there are no medication. One of our worker's wife who had a baby, um, she, get, she got an infection and she went to the hospital. They couldn't find the Tylenol for her um, to, um, to get to, to help with her fevers. So we wanted to, to help with medication. It's expensive and the diaspora has been good at, at um, you know, chipping in to buy food items and blankets because it's cold right now. Um, yeah, and, uh, and we need a lot of advocacy so international community can really help us because it's overwhelming and it's been going on. We don't know when it's gonna stop. Yeah, so Jimberi Fund right now is, you can't help a woman build a business if she doesn't even have a place to call home, if her children are sick, if her husband is wounded or killed. Um, right now we're kind of operating in emergency mode and we'd like to invite all of you to support us. I'm not here doing a like PR for Jimberi Fund, but this is a life and death situation and really all of our, um, our families are at risk. And like Adele said, we don't have a choice but to be here asking you guys for help because our government is not paying attention. The UN is not paying attention. So we have no choice but to do this. Um, you can go straight to our website, jimberryfund.org. Um, if you can pull it up, please, so they can, J-I-M-B-E-R-E. J-I-M-B-E-R-E, fund, F-U-N-D, dot org, yeah. Yes, that's it. Yeah, so you can go straight to our website and, and donate straight through there and just share our mission, even though right now we're not working on it, we're gonna resume as soon as things stabilize, but right now, well, we're just trying to help our families and, and friends and community that are stuck in a conflict area and being ignored by the rest of the world. Um, right now, we're going to open it up for questions. If anybody has questions, um, we'd love to answer them. Thank you so much for having us here and for listening to us. Come on, Lucy. <laughs> Maybe you can let it's them okay. ask. <laughs> um, I'm not really sure when I realized that this was my fault. I think we didn't even have a time to catch a break to process what has been happening. After the massacre, we went to Rwanda. After Rwanda, we, went to, we came to the US and had a whole string of challenges to conquer. And it wasn't really until I started college that all of this came crashing down on me. And I realized, oh wow, I am not okay. And it is not okay. Like what I went through is not okay. And nobody should have to go through that. Um, yeah, I think it's, it, it's a lifelong work for me and it's going to be. I don't think it's ever gonna get easier. I can, I can work through it and, and, and learn to live with it. But I don't think that, um, I don't think I'll fully understand the gravity of everything that I saw. 
those who have questions, because we only have one microphone, I ask you to please come up and then ask your question. Does anybody else have any questions? My name is Catherine. I'm an advocate for refugees in the area, and I'm honored to work with the population, so thank you. Um, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. I am looking to find out um, a little bit about how, how long it took you to get through school here, and what we can say or do to help motivate people that education is going to be their answer. When people get put into manufacturing jobs or housekeeping, and it's very hard to balance, um, as you know, your life and, and your work and, and having to pay bills. So what can we do as workers in the area to help motivate people to get back to school and help them realize the value of the education will come after the value of money? That's a, that's a challenge. One, I think, um, as the way you were raised, I feel like we were raised knowing that education was the answer and our parents really pushed us and, and, and they advocate for it. Um, the thing is, when, when you're an adult, older adult and you come here and you have an opportunity to make money and knowing that the challenges that you have and all the family members that you have left home majority of us work and we send money almost out of your paycheck we send maybe 20 percent out to africa to help our, our our families so it's hard to tell someone to be broke when they can work and then it's just like a short it's a shortcut and it, it it's it helps but it is it's not the answer um I wish I had a social worker like you who could tell me to, it's okay to do it, uh, but I, do you want to add? I can, I I can add something. I think one of the things would be just helping, because sometimes it's like, even if you want to, you think of how am I going to figure out this system? Sometimes it's, I don't really know how to fill out this application. I don't really know how to write that college essay. I don't, I don't know how to do any of these things. So I feel like when I had people supporting me, like when Ms. Koji came home mm -hmm. and brought me that application for Mercy High School, you know, and then was like, no, I'll help you, like sit here, like I'll help you. And then she drove me to take the test. And you know, oftentimes it's a matter of, if my parents don't really understand, uh, then I'm not going to understand. And so um, you, we need people to kind of go that extra mile, especially when you're dealing with people who don't understand English. Everything just seems very confusing and, and difficult. Um, and honestly, I don't, think I, I don't think I would have known about Mercy or like even known how to apply if Ms. Goji didn't, um, didn't go that extra step to help me. Okay, we can pass this. Are you sure? Mm -hmm. Okay. Hi, my name is Bob. I have a question. Uh, thank you for sharing stories. Um, how, talk a little bit about how families want to come alongside people who are new to this country, new to the language. How can we come alongside and help them well? Talk a little bit about that, please. Mm -hmm. Hmm. I think we had so many people that did that incredibly. One off the top of my head is Pastor Linda, who she went above and beyond for my family from just driving us to church and inviting us to share meals with our family and exposing us to different things in, in America and showing us all the opportunities we could have. Um, we really, you come here, you kind of turn into a child. So almost imagine like you're teaching your child how to do something because that's really kind of what we become because we don't understand anything about this country. Um, especially since I met a lot of people in your community that have been living in, that come here after living in refugee camps for decades. And so that's even a worse condition than when we came in here. Because when you live in a refugee camp, you live in this bubble of nothingness. Um, and you don't really know or understand much. 
for me, it was always the people that invited me and kept me close and made me a friend. Um, it made me feel like I, I was just their friend and not just the refugee that they're showing around, but more like oh, I'm spending time and, and learning and just you know observing and learning um, through friendship. It's really that simple. I don't think I have any other advice than just befriend them and just like how you would want people to treat you. I think a lot of times, for me, I hated it when pe I felt like people were just like parading me around in a sense uh, where I didn't feel like I was their friend and, all the, and rather like somebody they were helping. It's kind of, it, it actually lowers your self-esteem and confidence in the long run. It may seem like well-intentioned in the moment, but um, when you feel like somebody's like project, it actually lowers your confidence in yourself. Um, so just befriend people, and then usually they will tell you their needs and they will ask for help. Um, I also like, um, we, we, we were helped by the church that we, uh, we, we attended, one being Pastor Linda, he was, she was the senior pastor, but what she did that she also connected us to other families. She didn't do it alone. She connected us to other families that would pick us up for churches or for church events and also like kind of com connect us with our age group to do activities that our age group do here. Um, and it was, it, was, it, was, it was kind of like, it really helped us assimilate to the American culture. They showed us their ways of or celebrating different holidays. I still don't care for Thanksgiving, but um, like they showed us, I still can't cook turkey, but they would cook it for us. They'll bake it and they'll, they'll invite us or they'll just make it for us and bring it over. So it kind of felt like, oh yeah, we're, the, we're, we're celebrating Thanksgiving and we have to have a turkey. So um, just things that make a family and, and just showing it, let us decide if we don't want to do it, but show it to us so we don't just leave, we don't, you don't leave us out. Um, and then for school, I have many mentors in, in the church who checked out on me, they send me, uh, my mom doesn't know that you have to get mail, you know, if, when you're in college, when you get a, a, a notification that you got a mail or something, a lot of kids get excited. I didn't care if my mom didn't send me anything, but I had people from church who would send me scarves, just a no, and it was like, wow, I'm missing out. My mom, you should be doing this. But she, you know, she doesn't know, and I don't blame her. But little things like that, just, you know, it made, it, 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 it made me feel like, wow, I'm just normal. Like the other kids, I get mails, and I get small gifts, and things like that, you know. It just, yeah, just making us feel normal yeah. and welcomed and like we belong. And they'll visit. Of, yeah. Yeah. They're just showing us the American way and how things are. But also letting us teach them also about our traditions and the things we like to do. Um, I really yeah, love If you like, come to my house and you don't want to eat to Gali, don't mm, give me turkey. Don't even come to. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. Like, if you're not going to come to my house and let my mom cook for you, I don't want to come to eat at your house <laughs> either. Like, it. It, it, that's what I was saying about like not feel, not making people feel like they're some sort of project, and part of that is just also trying to learn about them and not just teaching them about America. Um, like I loved it when Mabel and Andre, which are some of our, our friends from Rochester, they would come home, learn songs in Swahili and yeah. Kinyamulenge, and play cards with us. Like, card games that we used to play at home and we taught them and they learned them. And so we, I truly felt like this is my first like best yeah. friend we in America. We teach them all the gesture we used to do in a choir back in Congo because we're like we're in a child children's choir. So, you know, we're in youth group and we would teach them the Kinyota, the Swahili songs and all the dances that we used to do, they must learn and do it the way we do it. So, and they'll teach us some uh, Christmas uh, carols. carols. Yeah. We didn't do that back home, but we danced and they do carols. So it was like, it was kind of fun and boring at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was not. Oh, remember, we would sing, we would translate some of the songs like, so Holy Night, um, mm -hmm. we have it in French and in, yeah. and in Kinyamulenge. Yeah. So we taught, we taught it to them. 
we, we will teach them how to sing it in, in our language. And so it really, like, I really do consider them some of my first friends in America because they didn't just show me around in America. It, they also, like, took a part of yeah. in my life. Our culture. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Sandra Uiringimana. This is my book, How Dare the Sunrise. It's a memoir detailing my life story from Congo. Uh, and fleeing and becoming a refugee in Rwanda and then eventually being resettled in America. It covers a lot of topics about war and about the refugee resettlement process in America. It is available everywhere books are sold, Barnes & Noble and Amazon.